Jan Narvison, I met Jan Narvison for the first time, what, a year and a half, two years ago, I guess, at, uh, at the Ontario Libertarian Party convention. And uh, I, I have to tell you that I just adored him from the beginning because he did his whole presentation in sock feet. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, it was just kind of neat to see the combination of intellectual and casual and all of this happening at the same time, and he just bounced about with enthusiasm over his whole presentation. And uh, so we invited Jan to speak at our conference last year in London, and I'm very pleased that Jacques considered inviting him again today. And uh, Jan's going to continue the discussion about justice in a stateless society. You can read about his, his academic achievements in the back of the book, but uh, one thing I would like to mention is that he has republished his book, The Libertarian Idea, in 2000. He brought a number of copies. They sold out on the uh, second day. But if anybody does want to purchase a copy, all you have to do is email Jan or talk to him before he leaves. Slip the $20 in his pocket and he'll mail it off to you. But I take great pleasure in introducing Jan Narvison. Um, is this working now? Yes? Okay. Let me say uh, a, a couple of things before I start. Um, one is that I brought along some copies of the address. Uh, I don't know whether there are any left, but if they are, they're right behind Jim uh, on the chair there. Are there any left? All gone. Okay. I also brought along some copies of a summary in English, which are all gone, and uh, some copies of the same summary in French translated by my daughter. I'm afraid I don't speak French. <laughs> uh, and I think there were some of those left a few minutes ago. Are there any of those left there? No? Oh, yes, yes. Somebody's raising them. So if anybody can read a French summary, you might find that a little bit useful. But then the next thing to say is that none of those are going to be exactly what I will do. <laughs> so. Uh, Hopefully, the um, overhead projector will, will help on this. Um, okay, let's yeah, have the first uh, uh, slide up. Now, um, the, the title of the talk uh, uh, in the, the book is okay. Uh, my other title, as you'll see on the uh, papers there, is Is the State a Mistake? Uh, of course, the state uh, is not a mistake if, as its proponents claim, it's the only way that you can provide justice. And so really the two questions are, I think, um, coextensive, or at least they are if you make <clears throat> certain assumptions about um, what the state is for. So for that purpose, I have, uh, I have manufactured a couple of extra slides because I think perhaps the talk by, by Mr. DeJazzi the other day uh, went very fast for many of you, and I think we need to be a little bit um, um, clearer uh, for the benefit of people who may not have been introduced to all these concepts. So let's put the next slide on, but keep the first one in reserve. It's gonna go back, okay, Mary? Thank you. Okay, now I'm sorry these are not very readable. This page points out that there are three theories of government. Most of you don't know that. <laughs> uh, these are very natural theories when I explain them. The first one, they're all found in Plato, actually. I mean, as somebody said, you know, Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Um, but at, uh, for this purpose, uh, Plato has a couple of very useful characters. The first one is a guy named Thrasymachus, or Thrasymachus, who occurs very early who occurs very early in Plato's Republic. And he comes on and he says, remember the topic is what is justice? And Thrasymachus says, justice is the interest of the stronger party. Now, this is a perfectly crazy idea if it's intended to be some kind of analysis of what justice means. It's not so crazy if you think of it as a, a kind of diagnosis of what's likely to happen uh, in the state. In effect, Thrasymachus says, if you're 
in the position of power, then you should use, you will use this power to maximize your own situation, to make yourself as rich as possible or whatever, uh, and you're a fool if you don't. I mean, that's Thrasymachus's political theory. So this is what you might call uh, the sort of um, the bad guy theory of the state. Um, the question is, is there any way to avoid this? Now, Plato thinks there is. He thinks that the state ought to be promoting not the good of the ruler, but the good of the ruled. So far, so good. But then the next question is, who decides what's good for individual people? And Plato's answer is that uh, clever philosophers do, namely Plato and his friends. Um, finally, there is liberalism, which came in about uh, um, two millennia later, with Hobbes in particular. And liberalism says that you, the individual, decide what's good for you. Now, <coughs> we all agree that liberalism is the right theory. Uh, our enemies are people, our main enemies, I think, are people who think that they know what's good for people better than those people do themselves. Because if you do think that, then uh, in order to do you a good turn, I don't have to ask you, right? I mean, I, I know what's good for you and you don't. So of course I get to tell you what to do and clobber you if you don't do it. I mean, that's, and the consequence of that is that the difference between view one and view two doesn't look quite so, um, so strong after that. I mean, what's the difference between somebody who admits that he's just out to screw me and somebody who screws me without admitting it, right? This is the, this is the problem. So what we would like to do is have a, a fully liberal political configuration. And this is what, um, I mean, Hobbes fought uh, we would start with and nevertheless have a state, and the question is whether he was right about that. Um, now let's go back to the next, yes. Right. Not back to, but forth to the next one. Well, we have two diagrams here which are the basis of all political philosophy, and you didn't realize that. <laughs> uh, Number one, which Anthony de Jazzy referred to the other day but didn't describe, and many of you will know this, but many others will not, is what's called the prisoner's dilemma. And here we have uh, person A, here we have person B. This is a two-person prisoner's uh, dilemma. And the structure of the dilemma is each of them has uh, two choices, X and Y, we'll call them. Um, and the problem is that there is a partial uh, but important conflict of interests. Namely, A's best choice is B's worst choice, or worst outcome. And B's uh, best outcome is A's worst outcome. And this is not so good, right? So the, the left hand uh, gives you uh, A's ordinal utility, the right hand gives you B's ordinal utility, right? So uh, one means first four means fourth. In between those two, we have um, an identity of interests. Uh, the upper left-hand corner is better for both than the lower right. Now, the problem is this. Um, I don't know how many of you heard the, the classic prisoner's dilemma, which gives it its name. It involves a couple of, of thieves who have uh, committed two crimes, a minor one and a major one. Uh, and the prosecuting attorney can only convict them on the, on the minor one unless he has help, unless one of them confesses. And um, uh, the major crime has a penalty of 10 years in jail, and the minor crime has a penalty of one year in jail. And the prosecuting attorney claps them in opposite ends of the local jail uh, without communication with each other, and he goes to each one and makes them a bargain. Namely, um, you confess, and if the other person doesn't confess, then you get off scot-free, your best choice, no time in prison. And he, meanwhile, goes to jail for 10 years, the full penalty. If, on the other hand, um, he confesses and you don't, then you end up 10 years in jail, and uh, he gets off scot-free. In between, we have the two cases where they both confess, 
in which case they each get a reduced penalty for cooperating, but still a fairly big one, let's say five years or six years in, in jail. And if neither of them confess, then they get the smaller penalty, one year in jail uh, each, right? Now, what are they going to do? Well, I mean, we're assuming they're completely amoral. No, no morals uh, here. Uh, where they're just acting on self-interest, and in particular, they're trying to minimize the amount of time they will spend in jail. So the question is, what are they going to do? Each one will see that what happens to him depends on what the other one decides as well as what he decides. So what are they going to do? Well, uh, A will say, well, look, suppose that B confesses. What should I do? Well, if I confess, then I get five years in jail. But if I don't, I get 10 years in jail, which is worse. If he confesses, I should confess. Well, what if he uh, doesn't confess? What should I do? Well, if I don't confess, I get one year in jail. But if I do, I get zero years in jail. Hey, no matter what he does, I should confess, right? And the other one will reason exactly the same way, because it's symmetrical. But the result of this is that each one, making his best rational move, will end up here spending four more years in jail than if they had both kept mum. So in other words, each one's individually rationally best choice leads to an outcome that's worse for both of them than this one. Somehow, what they need is to cooperate. Now, uh, uh, having an example with prisoners is unfortunate but it, because, of course, we want them both to be in jail for the longer period anyway. But if we go back to the state of nature case, the, the case where we're just people bumping into each other and there are no rules, no established uh, society, no government, whatever, etc., uh, then what is the situation? Well, Hobbes says, I think quite correctly, that the big question is going to be, uh, will you use violence to get your ways or not? Will we feel free, feel free to invade and despoil? Now, <clears throat> um, suppose that uh, I decide to make peace on the other guy, and I say, look, you know, I won't, um, I won't attack you. What should he do? Well, if he doesn't attack me, uh, we have peaceful cooperation. But if he does, then he gets the benefits of what I have to give him, plus not having to pay the costs of the cooperation, and he might view that as better, and vice versa. Hobbes thought that uh, in the state of nature, things would go very badly. As you know, he made a famous prediction that the state of nature would be what he calls a state of universal war, in which the life of everybody would be mean, solitary, nasty, uh, brutish, and short. Uh, <coughs> now, is he right about this? Well, this is very questionable in various ways. Um, and uh, of course, a lot depends upon whether the situation really is uh, a prisoner's dilemma, and if it is, what you know, uh, whether it's a solitary, one just one-time prisoner's dilemma or not. And of course, it's recently been discovered that if the dilemma is iterated, frequently repeated with the same players, then it's not so obvious that we should go ahead and use. Um, uh, force and violence against the other person because, of course, he can reciprocate. And tomorrow, we're going to be on the other end, and then uh, the Hobbesian prediction will, uh, will happen. But then we'll both be able to see this, so maybe we will start being nice to each other. Huh? That's the possibility. Maybe we will. Uh, if we are in a very large group with lots of people, however, there's a problem. And that is, the people that we interact with tomorrow may not be the same people that we interact with today. So um, if I cheat this person today, and then I go away so that tomorrow I'm not there, then uh, he will bear the cost, and I'll get the benefits, and I will have got away with something, uh, and I won't be you know, detected in this, and what do we do about that? Now, um, let me distinguish here between uh, the moral question and what we might call the operationally political question. The moral question is, what's the right principle here? And here our answer, I think, is very clear. The right principle is we should go for the cooperative um, outcome. 
Um, that is, our initial move should always be to cooperate with the other person, and only in the case where it's clear that the other person won't cooperate will we resort to individual force. This yields uh, the right of self-defense. Right? Now, <coughs> um, an interesting question is, is that all there is to it? And a plausible answer, I think, is yes. And in fact, that's what libertarianism consists of, the view that the right answer to that question is yes. We should only use violence to protect ourselves against other people's violence and for no other things. So anything else besides that is going to have to be done cooperatively. I secure the agreement of the other person to everything I do which affects him, and he secures my agreement to things that affect me. Uh, in lots of cases, of course, what we do doesn't affect each other, and in that case, fine, do what you like. I mean, that's the libertarian um, uh, basic moral postulate. Now, why isn't society uh, a nice, perfect place in which everybody respects everybody's rights all the time? Well, uh, the, the short answer is the failure of iteration, plus, of course, the fact that people vary. Now, this variation of people is uh, going to be pretty important, as we will uh, see shortly. But first, let's um, Francois slide this up. No, no, no. Uh, slide it up a little so we can see the bottom one. Um, Chicken, yes, okay. Now here is another um, game theoretic graph, which is unfortunately quite different from the first one. In the first graph, you'll notice, can you pull it down just a little? We can, yeah. The, the third best um, outcome is common to both parties there. Chicken is a bit different. Here's the model of the chicken game. Uh, if you've ever seen, there's an American movie, uh, um, a rebel without a cause, I think it was, but anyway, there's a game of chicken in that. You've got two automobiles full of teenagers, right? And they drive straight at each other on the country road. And the chicken is the one who swerves first, all right? Now, if you swerve first, then you're the chicken and I win, right? Um, and vice versa. But if neither of us swerves, we both try to be very brave, we crash into each other and we all get killed, and that's worse for both of us. So we have a common worst outcome here. Of course, the peaceable option where you just don't play the game is this one. I mean, or if we both swerve simultaneously uh, so that uh, nobody is the, the, the winner, uh, that's fine too, and then we can say we both came out, as it were, uh, second. All right, now what's the interest of chicken? Answer, coercion basically has the structure of chicken. With coercion, the situation is characteristically that, uh, I mean, if the, um, the hold-up man says, your money or your life, that departs from, number, from the second best outcome already. Um, he emerges with my wallet, um, and I emerge without my wallet, but with my life, which is better than emerging without my life, right? Now, of course, if I can shoot back, then uh, our worst outcome will be, will be uh, common here. Otherwise, the common worst will be a little bit different, and here's where the life gets uh, difficult for the theorist. Uh, <coughs> this worst outcome um, for me, in the case where I'm not armed, um, I mean, for the, for the gunman, uh, is it takes him a little longer to get my wallet, and he ends up with me lying on the ground dead, which is a, an extra nuisance to him. His worst isn't nearly as bad as my worst, because uh, I'm dead. <coughs> and notice that it looks as though it's going to be rational, if you're in a chicken uh, game, to be the chicken. Better to be alive without your wallet than dead, also without your wallet when it wouldn't do you any good anyway, right? So uh, suppose we've got a gang that can gang up on the individual. The individual can't do much to the gang. The gang can do a lot to the individual, and that's going to be um, um, a problem. All right, now, okay, now let's go back to the first printed slide. Yes, thank you. Let's go back to the question of government. Now, Hobbes famously argued that the solution to the state of nature problem is to set up a government which is a monopoly. Basically, 
a monopoly of compulsion or coercive force over the community, which Hobbes calls the sovereign. You'll remember that his great book is called Leviathan, and Leviathan is a monster. But it's an artificially created monster in this case. We all get together and we create the state. That's Hobbes' claim. If he's right about that, we are stuck with the state. He's right about it if it's the case that each of us, every last one of us now, will agree that we have to have this monopoly of compulsion set up in order to enforce the basic um, law of nature, which is what Hobbes thought we needed it for. And as I say, the important question is, is he right about this? Well, <clears throat> let's go back to the libertarian moral claim, which is that the use of uh, aggression of initiating force against somebody who is innocent is wrong. But the use of force for self-protection is, of course, uh, legitimate. I mean, if you start it, then I get to finish it. That's the, the, moral, the moral rule there. And moreover, I can protect myself not just by myself. I may be too weak to do so. But as Hobbes says, as to, I mean, Hobbes uh, claimed that we are all basically equal in the following sense, that even the weakest hath enough strength to kill the strongest, and that's roughly true. Um, <clears throat> there are all kinds of ways to kill people. Many of them don't require much strength. And of course, there's a possibility that we can secure the help of others in resisting aggression. Now, there's also the possibility that we can secure the help of others in committing aggression, right? And this is, of course, going to be the problem Hobbes thought, well, in order to uh, solve the problem of cooperative aggression, we've got to have a sort of super group big enough and strong enough to beat up on anybody, any lesser group in the society. That's why he thought we had to have a state with a, uh, a monopoly. Uh, now, we libertarians think that compulsion for other purposes is not legitimate. And here's where the fun begins. How, it's the old, old question, which goes back to Plato and no doubt earlier, which um, scholars describe as the problem of who guards the guardian. Who is gonna keep the artificial monster we've created, if we create one, from using force for purposes other than the correct purpose of protecting us? That's the question. And unfortunately, the answer is it's not clear that this can be done uh, at all. What makes it difficult? Well, um, what makes it difficult is the experience of several thousand years. That's one way to put it. Uh, the closest thing there is to some kind of solution to this uh, at the level of political theory, status theory, is democracy. But democracy, as we have been seeing, has its problems. Now, democracy basically is majority rule. What's natural about majority rule? Answer, the answer was provided by an old colleague of mine long ago. Uh, what democracy decides is who would win in a fair fight. Or to put it another way, <laughs> this way is ascribed to H.L. Mencken, though I haven't been able to uh, find the precise source of it. Mencken says, democracy is two foxes and a chicken sitting down to decide by majority rule what they shall have for lunch. <laughs> well, there's our problem. Democracy assures enough force to beat up on the bad guys. It also assures enough force to become uh, the big bad guy yourself. And the question is, uh, how do we go about avoiding this? I mean, that's a very dif difficult problem to which our feeble answer is, well, we have a constitution which restricts the operation of the majority. The big problem is, how do you get a constitution which actually works? What's gonna keep the constitution from eroding as the years go by, or even as the minutes go by? And uh, the trouble is, it's not clear that uh, fundamentally um, anything provides a very satisfactory answer to that. Um, <coughs> nevertheless, let's see what we can what we can do. Well, <clears throat> um, this just sort of continues um, the reasoning to the conclusion that we all agree to, which is that the trouble with aggression is that it imposes 
cost, and these are net costs. That is to say, if we're going to let people get their way by force, then that assures that we have an inefficient society. Because it means that some people lose in order that other people win. But of course, the losers are going to fight against the winners. And even if uh, the winners win, they'll win by nearly as much as if they didn't have to fight in the first place. Uh, what can we do to bring it about that um, nobody uses aggression um, at all, or that nobody does so um, effectively? Well, Bastiat's answer about this, and, and our answer, I think, is that the right way to deal with aggressors is to make them pay. That is, the idea is that the aggressor owes the, his victim compensation, basically. Here is the uh, victim going along peaceably minding his own business. Along comes the aggressor and imposes a cost on him. In order to get justice, um, what we need to do is to undo this somehow by making the aggressor pay not only a compensation for what he's taken from you, but also for the time and trouble it took to find out who did it uh, and track him down and make him pay. All those costs have to go to the aggressor. That's, that's our idea. If we can succeed in that, then um, we're in business. And the basic problem with the state as an answer to the problem of aggression is going to be that it really get, it's going to give us poor service. OK, let's have the next printed slide now. <clears throat> I've got only 10 minutes left? OK. Right. OK, so the problem with state protection is that the service uh, isn't a very good service. Its costs are going to be too high because they're compulsory. I mean, the state has a monopoly. As we know, when you're in a monopoly position, it means you can charge uh, an above market price. You can, you can get away with this. So maybe the solution is to try to decentralize this um, service. And how do we do that? Well, we do that by uh, saying, OK, each person fundamentally is responsible for his own protection, responsible in the sense that you arrange it. And you arrange it by enlisting voluntary agents to help you, e.g. you buy it, for example, from a protection agency selling protection or you form a protective uh, organization with uh, some of your, your, your fellows, and you all operate on the principle that it's the aggressors fundamentally who must pay. That is, when people commit crimes, what we want is that those people um, restore uh, the situation of the victims, rather than getting punished insofar as that's a separate, uh, separate thing. Now, I want to here just note a familiar fallacy of status. Um, this is a kind of public service. I'm, almost all of you must already know this, but just in case, <laughs> uh, let's remind ourselves that the right to liberty is what's called fundamentally a negative right. A negative right is a right which imposes on the other people a duty not to do something. A duty not to do something. So if you have a negative right against me, my duty is not to aggress against you, not, not to do the thing that would make it impossible for you to do what you have a right to do. The common fallacy says, but the right to liberty has to be positive. We have a positive right to protection. Now, a positive right means that other people would have a duty to provide the protection, not just a right, but an actual duty to provide this protection. They would have no choice about it, so we could make them pay. Right? And everybody would be required to pay for protection if that right is positive. Now, my point here is just that the negative right to uh, protection does not entail a positive right. The funda this fundamental argument, which you'll see all over the literature, not quite in those terms, but it amounts to this um, uh, among contemporary political philosophers, is just wrong like all the other arguments for the state that I've seen, by the way. <coughs> um, now, I'll put in a quick plug here. There's a, there's a, a book that uh, Jack Sanders and I edited called For and Against the State. And there you'll find a nice compilation of arguments against the state. And in my judgment, uh, the against win hands down against the, <laughs> the others. But anyway. <coughs> uh, okay. 
So Monopoly's problem is that, I mean, a Monopoly protection service provides incentives to use force for the wrong purposes. What in effect happens is that the state becomes a gang of thieves, the precise thing that Thrasymachus said it should be. And thieves, of course, engage in plunder, as Bastiat called it. Uh, the state undertakes not only to provide protection, but all sorts of other things. And often, by the way, the modern defender of the state will say that we're providing these things because they're really necessary for protection, right? I mean, I've seen this argued all over the place. And that's just another uh, um, many, many ways of committing the same uh, fallacy as this one. Right? If I owe you uh, uh, to protect your right to liberty, then I get to force you to go to school so you have enough knowledge so that you can, and, and all that kind of uh, stuff. And it's all wrong. Okay. Uh, also, now as we've seen with the chicken diagram, I mean, I mean it, it generates the following possibility that the state becomes not just a protection service, but a protection racket. That is, what the state protects you from isn't your fellow man, it protects it from itself. It says, you do this or I shoot. And since the state has this monopoly and it's you know, the united force of the majority, uh, then the likelihood is that I will lose. And of course, the likelihood is that ordinary people will obey the state for the, for the reason that we've already seen. Uh, democracy, as I noted, merely makes matters worse. Um, it, it will greatly increase the scope for the state to engage in what amounts to theft. And it will do this mainly because, um, nowadays, because the state lies to us. I mean, it has a wonderful ability to give people wrong information. Well, that's, uh, we, won't, we won't go into that right now. You all know that stuff. Let's go to the next slide. <coughs> okay. so. What about private protection then? Can it work? I mean, that's the fundamental question. Now, um, here is, I think, where uh, Michael's paper about Somalia is so interesting, so seminal. Uh, Anthony De Jazze, um, whoops, what have I got, one minute? Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, okay, all right. <laughs> um, Let's see. Yeah, De Jazzy, by the way, has written another a really great book, which is was is not the one called The State. That's a great book too, but he wrote another one called Social Contract Free Ride, uh, Blackwell, 1991. That's the one to read, but it's it's not easy, <laughs> so don't expect to read it, uh, you know, in an hour or two. It's going to take a while. But he makes a very very important point in this book about the Hobbesian argument, which uh, is one which we have to take very seriously. Why do we think that one-on-one -on -one transactions in the state of nature are a problem, as Hobbes thought? He thought the fundamental reason that we need a sovereign is you can't trust each other in the state of nature. And why not? Well, because a, a contract or a promise has the problem that I have an incentive not to do my, my share. If we agree that I'll do X and you do Y, well, uh, my doing X is a cost to me. I get the benefit from you and vice versa. Well, suppose that you act first. You provide me with the benefit first, and I don't have to pay until tomorrow. What do I do? Well, maybe I take the money and run, as in the Woody Allen movie, uh, rather than carrying out my part of the bargain. And the question is, is this a, a general problem? De Jazzy has a brilliant analysis of this problem, pointing out that Hobbes makes an assumption which is clearly wrong when you think of it. Namely, he assumes that one kind of promising situation is the, is the standard one for all. Now, instead, there are three different situations. One is where you and I exchange the good and service simultaneously, essentially. There's practically no time lapse between the two of us. In that case, we don't have to worry about the other guy not doing his share. We can see him doing it, and he can see me doing it, and it happens simultaneously, and there's no real uh, incentive to cheat. Another one is where we both agree to do something in the future. But again, it's more or less at the same time in the future. Well, if in the meantime, um, we see that the situation has changed and it doesn't happen, neither of us is out very much, right? It's the interesting case is the case where one person acts first and the other one acts second, and the one who acts second then has an incentive to c take the money and run. So that's the case that we need to worry about. That's the case where, for example, we might want to, I mean, if we don't trust the other person, set up 
uh, a protection agency, a protection agent. Now, the important question here, as the Jazzy points out, is, I mean, again, you're going to have the who, who protects you against your protecting uh, protection service, all right? But now there are going to be good answers to this. Whenever we have a society with any level of sort of social um, uh, coherence, which we, I mean, that's a long story, but uh, to make a long story short, there are very good reasons for thinking this will evolve uh, rapidly in any actual human um, society. In such a society, I can hire somebody to be my protector because he wants my business and he wants your business and the other guy's business and if he shoots me today, his potential customers are going to say, this is not the guy I want to protect me. Um, moreover, I need the protection against him, so this, uh, this other potential customer is going to hire somebody else to deal with my erstwhile protector, and as you can see, this is no way to run a business. So if you're going to make uh, protection into a private business, you have natural market incentives for doing uh, good service. Uh, <coughs> now, um, a very, very important point about this is that, you know, one way to uh, commit violence against somebody is to kill him. And, and this makes it very difficult to respond. I mean, uh, once you're dead, uh, pretty hard to get any compensation yourself. And that's why it, it makes a lot of sense to think, well, what we need is little organizations like families, for example, in the Somalia case, where there is a, a, an, an insurance function where the people get together and they agree that you know if one person gets, for example, killed, then the other people will collect compensation from the guy. They're not going to just let him get away with it. Um, what we want to know now is can we find um, something analogous to the family? I mean, I think we all realize that the Somali situation is very limited by the device of the family being the fundamental insurer. Can we? instead of a family, have a genuine uh, association where you buy into it or form a cooperative. But the plausible answer is yes, it does, it does look as though that ought to be possible. Now there are two arguments in the literature that I just want to mention, one of them you might be familiar with, claiming um, that uh, the idea of protection agencies will evolve naturally into a monopoly, the very thing we want to avoid. One is supplied by Robert Nozick, who argues in his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which I hope you've all read, uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that uh, in numbers there is strength. I mean, the bigger, the bigger protection agency is going to have a natural advantage over the little one, and eventually in any given area there's going to be uh, de facto monopoly, as he calls it. This is a very interesting argument, um, which I think I and many other colleagues who have thought about this have seen is wrong. It's very important that it's wrong. If it were right, that would be the end of the matter. But it's wrong in lots of ways. And the most important one is that bigger isn't better. Uh, you can see this in the following example. Consider the house, which protects itself by buying uh, one of these cameras and alarm systems and so forth. Here, little is better. You get much better protection from this little device than you do from the police force, which is many blocks away and which is going to be a long time getting to your door. Uh, much better for you to have a camera there and perhaps a gun um, <coughs> uh, to react very quickly to the threat. It's not obvious, in other words, that there is any kind of natural monopoly here. Um, people who want to defend the state, of course, think so. Uh, but this is an argument that has to be non-circular if it's going to be any good. And I think when you think about it, you can see that the argument uh, uh, is basically not right. Another possibility, which is advanced by a guy named Andrew Cowan, is that um, all the different protection agencies in the society will start colluding with each other. Um, and eventually, uh, they will end up being another one of the nasty monopolies. Now, that's an important possibility, too. But again, it's not obvious that this will have to happen, and the Somali examples give us a kind of counterexample because you have many, many different families there, and they don't end up colluding with each other particularly. I mean, the situation remains one of fundamentally decentralized protection, except, of course, against external aggression, which has always been a problem. I mean, if there's an area here with, let's say, no government, and an area over here with a government, that government will be, of course, up to the usual business of forming an army and maybe invading the neighbors, and then you'll have a problem. Uh, I'm not um, 
addressing that problem here for the following reason, <coughs> that it presupposes that there are states, right? I mean, you're gonna have that kind of aggression only if you've got states. But if we can undermine the case for the state in the first place, um, then we can reduce that problem to uh, one of no fundamental significance. Now, that's a very quick statement. And, you know, I mean, lots of work needs to be done uh, uh, about that one. So, I, I would now want to suggest that if Cowan's wrong, and given that Nozick is wrong, when, then we would expect competition among different protection agencies to lead to the conclusion we want, which is that each person gets all and only the protection that he wants. The problem with the state is you get too much, quote, protection, unquote, in some respects, and not enough in others. I mean, we know that um, most crimes in modern states are not actually, uh, the criminals aren't actually caught anyhow. Um, if you've seen the work of Bruce Benson giving details on this, it's pretty shocking how few of them actually uh, are uh, caught. So the state is very inefficient at providing protection anyway, and then it protects you against all sorts of things that you don't want to get protected against, such as yourself. Uh, <coughs> okay, so the general suggestion is it looks as though, in principle, uh, the anarchist option is a genuine live option, which is coherent. I mean, the, the, the challenge of statism is that anarchism is impossible. If we can show that it's possible, we've got to start. Mind you, it's a long way from there to actuality, and um, this is a big problem. Uh, it's especially a big problem given a democracy because how do you go about persuading a majority of your fellow idiots uh, that the state is a mistake? Okay, granted, that's a problem. We have no, whoops. We have no fellow idiots in the room. <laughs> yes, you okay. know, I'm, I'm not used to talking to people who <laughs> agree with me. I mean, usually in an audience this size, there's exactly one person with my views, and that's me. All the others are the enemy. Let's see if we can find somebody to have a bit of dissension. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Here comes Neil, the dissenter from England. Hurry, he's racing the other man to the mic. And he is uh -oh, ready. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Neil. I'm not actually going. To, I'm not actually going to dissent. Um, I'm just going to offer a suggestion. Okay. Um, we have all these negative rights which we know are valid, and the positive rights which we know are not valid. And you, very reasonably, said the right to protection is a positive right, so it's not actually a valid right. But what if we go one step back from that and say what is protection supposed to be against? Violence, and we. As we have a negative right, the right to life, the negative right is essentially tells people, thou shalt not murder. Yeah. If we go back and say we have a negative right to peace, meaning thou shalt not be violent. That's what we do say, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it is what we do say, so yeah. why, why do you not see that particular right in, for example, the United Nations <laughs> Declaration? Ah, well you see, here's the problem. I mean, the, the, uh, this is what Hobbes calls the first law of nature, seek peace and resort to violence only when the other guy does first, only for defense. Now, here is the problem. I mean, I, I, well, there's, there's, there's one and one half problems here. Now, problem number one is it's so easy to warp this around in such a way that in order to get the peace, we have to have all kinds of positive rights as well. Right? That's what the statists all say. That's what the UN says. Um, and the one half the problem is there are all these people out there, I mean, it's in a way it's not a little problem, who think that we've got some more rights besides this fundamental uh, right. They claim we've got rights, for example, to equality in various things, including economic and otherwise. Now those people, we have to show them that they're wrong. I mean, there is no way to avoid philosophy at this point. Um, by the way, I have written an article entitled Recent Arguments for Egalitarianism, in which I explore um, what I divide up as six and one half arguments for egalitarianism to show that they're all wrong. Uh, the most important wrong one is found in Rawls' Theory of Justice, which is the most popular book written on this in the English language in the 20th century, unfortunately. Uh, it has had tremendously wide influence, and the fact that it's wrong is pretty important. Um, this paper, by the way, uh, 
I'm including in a collection which is going into a new book, which isn't out yet. But uh, anybody interested, email me, I keep in touch, and I'll be able to say soon what the publication date is. But also, I can send you a copy of it by email anytime. So uh, anyway, I mean, I think the fact that the arguments for e equality are bad is very, very important because there are people out there who think that they're good. I mean, that there, there really is a right to equality. And so we have to show them that they're wrong. <laughs> but yeah. luckily, we can do that. Thanks. <laughs> just, just my view on equality, um, if they have a right to make me equal, then I should have an equal right to make them equal. Sure. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll both end up that way. Lucky devil. <laughs> Justice is everybody getting the same raw deal. I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Okay. Um, first of all, um, a theoretical problem. In a, um, a system of uh, protection agencies, we can have also uh, just a problem uh, when uh, there is uh, one agency that was uh, very str uh, really stronger than uh, all the others. In this case, uh, how to protect the individual rights of uh, the memberships of the other little yep. uh, uh, protection agencies? And uh, the other one is not uh, really a question, but I think uh, a psychological observation. Because uh, it's very difficult to uh, persuade people to, um, uh, to become uh, free. Because uh, I think that uh, all the people feel themselves protected by the state and have uh, the fear to defend the, themselves. Yep. And um, I think that uh, this is the largest problem yep. of this kind of well, I, I agree with you on the second one. Now, on the first one, I mean, you're right that we want to discuss this possibility. Notice that um, as a, as a large-scale social problem, there is an, that it assumes that crime pays, right? And crime cannot pay in any, any sort of long-run, large-scale situation. I mean, uh, peace has the advantage. Uh, now, we have to be able to, you know, explain why this is true, but the result of this is going to be all the little protection agencies are going to point out that the people paying money to the big one that's committing aggression are paying too much. They're going to be incurring a cost that they don't need to incur. Uh, right, and now this requires pointing this out to them, you know, we need circulation of information, and ad admittedly that's a problem. I mean, I'm just a philosopher talking in the abstract. I think we can prove this in the abstract, and that's very important. Once we can do this, then my argument that the market is going to uh, uh, lead to a situation in which that doesn't happen will then have effect. But I mean, it is a very important thing. We have to argue it. Uh, the work has to be done in detail, and you know, it's a good question. As to the second one, you're absolutely right about that. But there, I want to point out that the average person believes this because he's been lied to so much. I mean, um, people believe that the state protects them, even when there's plenty of evidence before their own eyes that it doesn't. Now, to those people, what we've got to say is, you know, look, there are alternatives. Um, at, the, at the lowest level, of course, there's the alternative provided by actual private protection agencies. Uh, very few people that I know of are aware that actually most protection in the United States and Canada, too, is actually private, not public. Indeed, I think it's more like, it's a, something like 80% of all the uh, protective servicing done in the United States is done by private hired uh, p little, little police forces and, and guards rather than by the public ones, right? That's one of the main reasons why the United States is as relatively safe a place as it is. If we had to depend on nothing but the public police, we'd be in very, very bad shape. <laughs> so you have to point out things like this, and the state of course, doesn't, has an interest in not pointing them out to you. Indeed, the state, I mean, the state really just lies to us all the time. I and mean, there's nothing more important than the state lives by mendacity. If it weren't for lying, I think the state would really wouldn't last very long. So we've got our work cut out for us. <laughs> As you can see, the, each of the questions leads to actually a, a very, uh, a need for a very detailed explanation. And we really, on that basis, only have time for one question. But I think there are three of you standing there. Why don't you just look at each other and decide which is the one that gets to ask the question? <laughs> there's, there's two foxes and one chicken there. <laughs> Bill Stewart. Okay. No, wait, yeah. <laughs> uh, since you've been discussing Hobbes, uh, it's worth looking into some of his background on this. Because his, 
it, it's not just that he considered his neighbors to be nasty, brutish, and short, but they, he was, where he was living, his family had a castle just north of the British Scot or the English Scottish yeah. border over an extended period of time. And so you've asserted that essentially repeat interactions and repeat business are what promote peace. Yeah. Uh, in that environment, for a period of several hundred years along the border, essentially the repeat interactions were usually we'll go steal their cattle and then they'll come and steal our cattle yeah. and we'll go steal their cattle again and it seemed to be something that did not stabilize because there were enough mm -hmm. options to go yeah. raid your neighbors and uh, make your living that way in addition to trying to do yeah. some of this. Um, interested in what you do to help people have the view that the balance is that it doesn't have to always yeah. be that way even though it was for yeah. him. Notice that, that, that the Scots didn't have much luck establishing a state either. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is an interesting historical point, you know. And um, I, I would make one general point about this, this kind of observation, and that is we always have to distinguish between a, what a philosopher claims he's doing and what personal reasons he might have for doing it. Now, the personal reasons he might have for doing it might be interesting, and they might even lead to some kind of adjustment in the theory, but remember, he's, he's claiming very abstractly. I mean, Hobbes claims to be writing for all men at all times. Da 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 da, da therefore we need the state. And um, so whatever the bearing of little things like that is, and I mean, he, he's, he's made a very sweeping statement which we've got to examine uh, on its own right in the abstract. But I agree with you that it is very interesting. It's probably true of almost every philosopher that there's some kind of personal background which you know, gives us some insight into why he says what he says. And sometimes it will also provide part of a refutation of it or a qualification of it and so on. But then, then we're getting into scholarship and we're not here for that. <laughs> And the qualification of all these discussions is we want less of all that force. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate that very much, Jan. Thank you very much. Oh, one, one little Go more self-advertisement. Yep. I promised some people uh, I had some brochures about my chamber music, my private uh, chamber music society that they might. Here they are. Anybody wants one? I'll, I'll leave those out here too. Okay. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, do we do we still need to set up the uh, projector? Okay. So there's going to be a little bit of.